Good morning, Faith Life Church. Great to have you here today. And uh, do I have any men hanging around from the men's conference? Yes, amen. We had a great time. Had a great time at the men's conference. I really enjoyed that and glad to see the guys show up. This place was full, ladies. It was completely full of men. Amen. It was awesome. Hey, I want to welcome our PAL campus right now. PAL, great to have you joining us live. And uh, also our online campus all over the world today. Great to have you as well. It is a great day in the kingdom of God. Always is a great day in the kingdom of God. We are starting a brand new series today called The Holy Spirit and His Gifts to the Church. So I need you to take notes during this because there's some scriptures and things you will need to remember as we cover it. You know, there's never a time, I think that there, there never was a time, but I think people thought there was a time that you could just kind of play church, go to church, and live the life during the week like you want to. But uh, it didn't work out so well, did it? But it's going to get worse <laughs> if you try to live your life in the flesh and uh, not actually practice what you preach and teach. You know, you need to. I mean, you need to hear the Holy Spirit. Let me say it again. You need to hear the Holy Spirit. The Bible says he is your counselor. And you're facing times that there's a lot of things you need to know about and how to move with God. In fact, the Lord's Prayer says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, meaning that you will be warned of things and you can move accordingly by the Holy Spirit. Joseph was, remember, when they came after, he said, leave and go to Egypt, right? And you know, God's the same today. He'll tell you. He'll, he'll help you. And we're going to talk about that in this series, the Holy Spirit and his gifts. Now, the Holy Spirit has nine gifts of the Holy Spirit that are listed in the Bible. Now, Jesus is the head of the church, and he has given us five governmental offices in Ephesians, the fourth chapter. You might remember those, you know, apostles, prophets, uh, teachers, pastors, and uh, what's the last one? Evangelists. There's five of them there. And then, of course, the Holy Spirit gives us nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, All of them are geared to help you win in life, win against the enemy, and to carry your assignment into the earth realm. You need these gifts. So we're going to cover those in the Holy Spirit in this series. So I wouldn't miss any of it. You need to know these things. They're yours. They're already yours. But we want to help you understand how they function and how you can use them in your daily life. Amen? The nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. i got to lay some groundwork first. And uh, I want to talk about just the Holy Spirit in general, how we tap into that. Well, you know, when you were born again, you know, first off, you're three parts. Is that right? You're a spirit, you have a soul, your mind, will, and emotions, and you have a body. When you're born again, your spirit reconnects with God's spirit. You become one with God in, in the spirit. And, of course, Adam had that, but he kicked God out, remember. He lost that connection. And so now through Jesus Christ, we're born again. We now have God with us, and we can hear God. In fact, the Bible says we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, being born again. But there's more to that. Let me give you a little history. Uh, Some of you already know this, but I want to make sure we cover it in this series. And that is, I was raised in a denominational church, not saying they're bad. I'm not uh, trying to point at any particular church or denomination. I mean, we're, we're all, you know on the same team. I was born again in that denominational church. I praise God for that. I was in fifth grade and we had VBS and I can still remember today what was going on. We were making something with popsicle sticks. I can remember that. And uh, we were close enough to the church that I walked to that church and that VBS. And I remember walking home from that day. They had a guest speaker, a young man speaking about the kingdom of God in the sense of salvation. And I said, yes, I went forward, and I walked home, and I remember something was different. I, had, I just can't explain it. I just, something was different. Now, you know, through the time, I mean, church was religious to me back then. It was uh, a date on the calendar, and it really didn't have, I didn't have a lot of teaching. And so through my high school years, you know, even though know, I went to church, it really had really very minimal impact on my life. But about the age of 19, you know, I think people at that age group, you know, 18 to 22, 20, you know, they began to think about life. You know, who am I? What am I to do with my life? And I was thinking along those lines and wondering about God in my life. And I was, I was kind of hungry for finding the truth out, you know, about this thing. I wasn't interested in religion. 
I, I wanted to know there was more than that, just going to church and going through the motions. I figured, you know, because they taught us that all of the miracles had passed away. You know, all those things are gone with the apostles. But something inside of me, you know, I just said, there's got to be more than just this religious side of routine, you know. And so I ran the pizza shop, one of my dad's pizza shops that's here, here in New Albany where our church is located and up the road in Johnstown, my parents still have a, a two, a two pizza shops. And so back in that day, I was running one of those shops for my father. And one day this man walks in and he begins to talk to me. He says, I'm holding a revival down the street. He said, I'd like to invite you to it. And we, you know, okay. He said, uh, Jesus is still doing the same things he did in the Bible. Now that, that got my attention because I'd never seen anything. I said, no, wait a minute. You're telling me that Jesus is still doing the same exact things that I see he did in the Bible? He said, absolutely. Healing, everything you see he did, he's still doing. And I, I, I had to see that. I said, I said, where's that revival at? And so I went down there to that revival. And when I walked in there, the presence, you know, I didn't know the terminology back then. I didn't know the term anointing or anything. I just knew it felt different in there. And I felt you know, the presence of God. And in that meeting, he asked for those that wanted to make a commitment to Christ to come forward. And I did. And I'll tell you what, it, it, uh, it, it just was like, I was like, being born again all over again, man, I tell you the joy of the Lord. I was so excited about that. And so I decided to go to that little church, you know. I decided I'll, I'll, just, I'll just keep coming down to that little church. And I did. It's a small church. You know, maybe there was 100 people there, 80 people there. I don't remember the numbers. But a small church. So you kind of bumped into everyone there. And there were some ladies there that were talking about miracles still happening today. And they're talking about the Holy Spirit. Now, I had never heard, you know, growing up, I didn't hear much about the Holy Spirit. Did you? I don't know. I never heard much about it. And uh, anyway, so I, I was like, wow, okay, you know, those things really happen, you know? And they said, yes. Said, you know, I found out they had a Bible study. They had it every uh, once a week in the morning. Now, at that time, I was working at night with my dad's pizza shop. So I asked them, I said, yeah, I know it's a woman's Bible study, but would you care if I came? And they said, well, no, you know, come on, that's good. So I began to go to that Bible study, and they began to talk about this Holy Spirit. I had never heard the term baptism of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit in general. And they began to talk about that and talk about this scripture out of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Uh, please underline that comes on you there. And you'll be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Now, I had a lot of questions. You know, what is that? I mean, the, the Holy Spirit's going to come on. I didn't know. They said, look, we, got a, we have a big meeting coming up. Uh, it's called Women's Aglow. And, and that season, if some of you guys were there back in that time period, the charismatic renewal is happening, meaning that the, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit were kind of flowing out of the Pentecostal churches into the denominational churches. And so they had a couple organizations. One was Full Gospel Business Fellowship that was traveling around the country, and they were teaching the baptism of the Holy Spirit to businessmen and having their meetings. Then the ladies had the Women's Aglow Fellowship, and they're still, it's still a functioning uh, group today. But I think the businessmen, I don't think it's functioning today. I don't think. But uh, anyway, so they said, would you like to go downtown at this big meeting? I said, well, sure, you know, I'd like to go. And so I, I remember going to that. And a lady stood up. Now, one thing that caught my attention, it had that same feeling that I had in that church there, that night where the evangelist was there. And uh, they began to sing. And I remember hearing people speaking in other languages. It was kind of confusing and exciting at the same time. I really didn't know what to think about it, but a lady got up and she began to talk and teach out of the Word of God about this baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so she said simply, you know, after she taught, would you like to receive this? Would you just come on up front? We'll lay our hands on you and pray for you that you receive it. So I went up front. They laid their hands on me and up out of my belly, out of my spirit, I began to speak words that I, I didn't understand. And uh, the anointing of God, this presence of God came on me. And I was excited, friend. I mean, because this is real, and I was excited to find out that the Bible is still alive today. 
I was like, whoa, this, why aren't people talking about this, man? I was like, you know, I was excited about it. And at the time, I was leading, if you want to call it that, uh, we had a young people's fellowship at this small little church. I was 19. We had about 16 or so kids that show up there, and I was in charge of kind of one of the leaders, so to speak. I didn't know anything, but I was one of the leaders. You know, we'd have pizza and have some fellowship. We'd have a little Bible study, and that was all good. It was all good. But I could not wait to bring that truth to them. And I thought, they're going to be so excited to hear that God is still alive. You know, it's like, this is going to be awesome. So I went to that church. It was in Sunday night. And uh, in that day, we'd have them sit on the floor. We had that night, had them sitting in Indian style on the floor. I don't know why we didn't have chairs. I don't know why. We, they were, they're sitting there. I don't know. But anyway, pastor was next to me. And I was glad he was there. You know, he doesn't always come to that, but he was there. And I thought, this is great because he's going to affirm everything I'm telling him. And it's going to be great because he's right here beside me. And so, you know, I was totally naive. I mean, I really didn't know much. And I didn't know anything about what pastor thought about it either. I never heard him mention it before. But I, it's in the Bible, so I thought he'd be all for it. So anyway, uh, I just told him what happened to me. I knew nothing except Acts 1-8. <laughs> I knew nothing. And I just began to tell him what happened to me. And I said, just like the lady did there at that meeting, if you'd like to have this, you know, just pray. And I, that's all I, all I knew. I mean, I didn't, uh, I didn't pray in tongues in front of them or tell them what to expect. I told them nothing. I just said, close your eyes and bow your heads like a good denominational prayer. You know, it's how I was taught to pray, right? So I just said a few words in prayer. And as I had my eyes closed, I heard this commotion break out. And I looked up, I heard people weeping, laughing, shaking, crying, and uh, praying in tongues. <laughs> I mean, I have to say, I was a little shocked, you know. I mean, I knew it was real, but I was really like, wow, this, this is really real. It happened in here, you know. And um, at that moment, of course, the, the pastor tapped me on the shoulder, and he immediately took me into the next room and said, this is a quote, not having this here, he said. This is of the devil. And I was confused. You know, I looked up to my pastor. I was a young, young guy, right? And I thought to myself, of the devil? I said, I didn't touch them. I didn't do anything to them. I said, I just didn't believe that. In fact, I knew it, wasn't of the, I knew it couldn't be of the devil. And uh, he said I couldn't uh, lead the youth anymore. So I was a little confused by that. You can understand that, being 19. And then the, the next week, all, the whole youth group, we all sat in the back of the church. We, we were, you know, we were in the doghouse, man. It's like, we didn't know what to do. You know, it's like, the pastor's kind of bothered with us, you know. We didn't know what to do, but, you know. Anyway, we're sitting there, wooden pews, and our church had this quiet moment of meditation. Maybe you've been in churches like that. Now, I grew up in that church all my life. And so I was well accustomed to the quiet moment of meditation. It really meant that you don't move, breathe, say anything. You, you just, it's absolutely, anyone else ever grow up like, it's just absolutely, you don't violate that, man. It's God, you know, just nothing. Anyway, I was shocked as I was sitting there in this quiet moment meditation on the end of the pew behind me, someone got up. And walked up beside me and tapped me on the shoulder. Can you believe that? I was totally taken back. It's like, who would be standing up in a quiet moment meditation and walking around? I look up. It's one of these youth. And the thing I noticed immediately was they were glowing with that same glow they had the week before. And he just said, he said, let's go. He said, let's go. Let's go. I thought, I remember thinking, go where? And he could tell I was confused. He said, my mother's been sick because she's sick. And uh, I'd like you to pray with her, with me. And then I remembered, of course, his mother was facing a severe back surgery of fusing five vertebrae. And uh, she was a very small woman, maybe five foot, and very thin. He's an only son, so he's concerned for his mother. And I thought, okay, that's, not, that's, that's fine. I can do that. So... We go up to the front. Uh, yes, it's during the quiet moment meditation, but I figured, you know, that is a time of prayer, and this makes sense. We can pray for her. She's facing this surgery. But then I was really shocked when he actually picked her up. He went and scooped her up off the seat she was at and carried her to the front. 
I thought, man, who does that? You know, it's like, what's going on here? And he set her down there right in front of the pastor, and he began to pray in tongues as loud as he could. <laughs> what do you do with that, right? Everyone is now nothing, you know, it's like, what's going on? Well, then I understood what was happening. I had just told him the week before about this baptism of the Holy Spirit. He just received it with praying in tongues. He is now praying in tongues. He had heard Acts 1.8, that power of God will come upon you to be a witness. And uh, he believed it. And now he's praying for his mother. And so he knew that I, someone had to explain to them what's happening. He figured I told him, I'll tell them. So I turned around, you know, I, I still remember everyone's eye was on me at that point. Turned around and I remember all I said was, because I didn't know much. I just said, it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, and it is, it is. It's in the Bible. But anyway, she was healed. And that caught those people's attention. And at going through Kroger's that week, I ran into one of the ladies that was there that, uh, that, uh, that day. And she said, oh, that was totally amazing. That woman is healed, she said. And then she did this. She just scrunched her face up. But, oh, those tongues, she said. Now, why would she react like that? That's, that's kind of crazy. Lady, the woman was healed. <laughs> Think about what you're saying. How many times have you seen that in that church like that? Uh, ever? I don't know. I'm not going to judge that church. But I'm saying, <laughs> why would that bother you that she's healed, right? All right, so we need to talk about that today. So I, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So let's, let's dig into that a little bit. Uh, go back to Acts 1.8 and talk about that. Now, obviously, you're born again. When you're born again, as, as I said, you're, you're one with God. But uh, let's talk again about that. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So I want you to remember that phrase. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. If you're in a court case and you call a witness, what is their job? What, is, what are they to do there? They are to testify, right? And bring what? Evidence. They are to testify and bring evidence. And you are to what? Testify and bring evidence. You are like the witness on the stand that is going to bring testimony and evidence of the kingdom of God. That is the church's role. Mark 16 says, these signs shall follow them that believe. You know, people are going to see. See, signs are not the reality. They point to where the reality is. They're a sign. Jesus is your answer. Jesus, go to Jesus. These signs, how did that happen? How is that person healed? How are they in the right mind now? How is their marriage restored? How are they winning in finances? They point, go to Jesus. Your answer's over there. All right? Bringing testimony and witness and evidence into the earth realm of God's kingdom. That's what the church is called to do, friend. That's what you're called to do. This power, this strength comes upon you. We call it an anointing. Anointing means to wipe on, to, to cover with. It's like a cloak, like a Superman outfit. Cloak you, okay? Now, let me ask you this. How many, how many uh, miracles did Jesus do as he was growing up? None. Now, did Jesus need to be born again? No, he was never dead in his spirit. He was never separated. See, he wasn't of Adam's lineage, was he? No. See, Adam's lineage was tainted. All humankind had been tainted by sin. But Jesus was born of a different father. See, God, the Holy Spirit, was his father. Mary had, see, she wasn't, he wasn't of a natural uh, father, was he? So he was never dead in his spirit. He was always alive in his spirit. Or if we want to put it in our vernacular, you know, he was born again. I mean, he, had, he was alive to God. He was like, you know, Adam was born again in reverse. We have to have that restored through Jesus. Praise God. Now, he didn't do any miracles. Why not? Because he couldn't. He was living and operating, as the Bible says, as the son of man, not the son of God. Now, he only began doing miracles after he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, Acts 1.8, he had to have the same thing, he had to have the same thing you need. Now, we pick that up here in the, the um, Matthew chapter 3. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John to be baptized by him in the Jordan River. 
but John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me. So Jesus replied to him, let it happen now, for it is right for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John yielded to that. After Jesus was baptized, just as he was coming out of the water, the heavens opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and doing what? Coming to rest on him. Everyone say, on him. Not in him. Now, he's alive to God. Did you, we established that. Is that right? Okay, so he was never dead to sin like we are. You have to be born again, right? He's alive to God. So he has the Holy Spirit already. He's alive to God. But yet nothing happened until he was cloaked with this power from on high, this anointing from God. So let me, let me give you a visual what this looks like. When you're born again, you are righteous before God. You remember in the Old Testament, if they touched the Ark of the Covenant, what would happen? If they had, didn't have the authority to do so, they, it would kill them. Is that right? Yeah. When you come to God, you are now declared righteous before God, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now you can carry the Ark, if you will, as an analogy. You see, you can carry God. See, see, God is looking for a vessel that he can, carry, he can move in the earth realm. So you're now the righteous vessel, right? You got that? And so when this Holy Spirit, this baptism comes on you, it's like you carrying God around so he can do his work. See, even Jesus said, it's not I that does the work but my Father. Remember? That's what he said. And so it is with you. And so you are the righteous vessel that is now legal to carry the anointing of God into the earth realm. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Not only Jesus did it, now the church is commissioned to do the same thing. To carry God around. To carry this anointing of God himself in the earth realm. So we find, uh, let's talk about this question people have. Well, pastor, I thought when I was born again, I thought I received the Holy Spirit. You know, we start talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. People get confused. They say, well, I thought you did receive the Holy Spirit. You are alive to God. Your spirit is one with God. You are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes, you are. But again, John had to baptize Jesus. He had to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. John chapter 20 gives us insight into what happened in your life. Jesus, after his resurrection, appeared to his disciples. In, in the, there at 19 to 22, he appears before them showed him his hands, his feet, his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Verse 21, so Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. Just as the Father has sent me, I also send you. After he said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. That is when they were born again, friend. That is when the disciples were born again. Now notice he said this, this, these words here. He said, peace be you, verse 19, peace be with you, verse 21. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. Just as the Father sent me, I also send you. And he breathed on them, and they're born again. Now, in John chapter 15, Jesus, speaking to the disciples before he left them, says this, all I have spoken about, you know, before I've left you, I want you to remember these things. He said, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, but do not be afraid. What was Jesus' peace? That he could hear God. He'd have a, a solution for every problem. And so now they're born again, you see. They don't have to run to the prophet to find God's will out. They don't have to go look for the, for the will of God. See, now they're one with God themselves. God's spirit has the thoughts of God. See, now they have the ability that the Holy Spirit's now their counselor, that he's in them. And Jesus said, my peace I give you. God is with you now. You're born again. He breathed on them. Okay, everyone got that? That's when they're born again. But he said something else in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 4, on one occasion. Now, this is after they had been born again. He says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. 
For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, hold it, guys. Don't go anywhere yet. You're not equipped yet to be a witness and bring evidence. You don't have the power of God operating there like Jesus had. Yeah, you're born again, and the Holy Spirit is in you, but to do these things to bring evidence, you need to be cloaked with God himself, his power, to do that. And you're, not, you're not there yet. Okay, everyone stand it. Do not leave Jerusalem until this happens. They're in the upper room, 120 of them, the Bible says. And then in Acts 2, verse 1, the day of Pentecost had come. They're all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a violent wind blowing came from heaven and filled the entire house. As tongues were spreading out among them, and fire appeared to them and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to do what? Speak in other tongues or a language they didn't understand as the Spirit of God enabled them to do so. Now, what is this? What is this? I mean, people go, what, they, what they said, what is this? These people act like they're drunk. We hear them speaking in all these different languages. We know they don't know those languages. Peter then stands up and tells them what's happening. He said, these guys aren't drunk as you suppose. He said, this is what the prophet Joel prophesied, that I'll pour my spirit out upon all flesh. This is that. This is that day. And so he then goes on to preach Christ to this crowd, thousands there that day. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, he concludes his message with these words. Now, the Bible says, when the crowd heard this, they were, they were acutely distressed and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what should we do? Peter said to them, repent, each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far, far away. As many as the Lord God will call to himself, even in 2023, this is for you. So let me repeat, this gift of the Holy Spirit, this baptism of the Holy Spirit we just saw happen is for the New Testament church. It is for the church. But the church has fought against it for years. In fact, many still do, saying it passed away. Well, I wonder, wonder where that came from. I'll tell you what, that lady in Kroger's, oh, I hate those tongues. She'll have an agreement. Satan could say the same thing. Oh, I hate those tongues, he would say. We'll find out today why he hates it. That's why he fought against it. Now, there broke out a uh, persecution there in Jerusalem after this day of Pentecost, where they had all these people gathered together and uh, received salvation. We go to Acts chapter 8, verse 4. I'm, I'm trying to bring evidence to you of this, of how this functions and how it happened there. Now, they were forced to scatter, the Bible says. Philip went down to the main city of Samaria and began proclaiming the Christ to them. The Christ, salvation to them. The crowds were paying attention with one mind to what Philip said because they heard and saw signs. This is the formula, friend. He was performing for unclean spirits crying with loud shrieks coming out of people. People that were possessed. Many paralyzed. Lame people were healed. There was great joy in that city. Word got back to the church in Jerusalem. They remembered what Jesus said. What did he say? Do not leave Jerusalem. Don't do anything until you receive this baptism of the Holy Spirit. So they were concerned about that. It says in verse 14, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word, what was he preaching? What word was he preaching, friend? Christ. He was preaching Christ. They received salvation. Okay? Peter and John were sent down there. These two went there and prayed for them so that they would receive the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit of God had not yet, what? Come upon them. It had come in them, they're born again, but it had not come upon them, any of them, but they had been simply baptized in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
meaning they came unto salvation. Peter and John placed their hands on the Samaritans, and they received the Holy Spirit. Well, how do we know what happened to them? Was it just like on the day of Pentecost? Did they pray in tongues? And It said there, remember, all of them received that ability to pray in tongues. Well, there was a man there named Simon. He saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of hands. And he offered money to the apostles saying, give me this power too so that everyone I place my hands on may receive this Holy Spirit. So obviously there was evidence of them receiving. And I know it was the same thing that happened there on the day of Pentecost. He saw the same effect. And he wanted that power. They were were kind of interrupting his plan there. He was known as one of the leaders, you know, spiritually, if you will. And uh, he wanted to have that uh, notoriety, notoriety himself. His heart was wrong because it would be all about him. And the apostles corrected him, right? Now, another example, Peter is led by the Spirit of God to go preach Christ to Gentiles. Now, the Jews didn't understand yet that the Gentiles would be included in the church. So, by the Holy Spirit, he is led to go to a man named Cornelius' house, a Gentile. And he goes in there, Cornelius has gathered some friends, and he is now proclaiming Christ to them. And in verse 44, it says, while he was still speaking, in fact, his words in verse 43 were saying, basically, whoever calls on the name of Jesus. At that moment, while he was still speaking, the Holy Spirit did what? Did what? Fell on them who heard the message. The the Jews there who had accompanied Peter were greatly astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them doing what? Speaking in tongues and praising God. This is the formula. This is what, this is what happens. This is, hap- this is what happens. That's, that's what it happened. Okay, so he did not touch them. He did not model for them anything. They simply said yes to Jesus when he said that phrase, whoever calls in the name of Jesus, I'm sure their hearts leapt. Just yes. Born again as they heard those words and the Holy Spirit came on them. Praise God. Now, I always say one of the easiest scriptures to point this difference out of being born again in the baptisms, Acts 19. Paul's traveling. He comes across a group of disciples. He thinks they're Christians. And so he he comes there, and he asks a question, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Notice, Paul's question was one of his priorities. In other words, he understood it's possible to be a believer and yet not have this baptism of the Holy Spirit, but notice how important he thought it was that he was going to ask them, have you received it yet, just like those disciples in Jerusalem felt it was necessary to go to these new believers immediately and to make sure they understood how to be equipped with the Holy Spirit for the ministry God's called the church to. Amen? Notice how quickly he addresses that issue. They said, no, we haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit. He was perplexed. And what baptism did you receive? They said, John, John the Baptist. He said, well, John's baptism was one under repentance to prepare your heart for for Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus, meaning they received Jesus as their Savior. And Paul placed his hands on them. The Holy Spirit did what? Came on them. And they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Let me back up to that scripture we talked about with Cornelius. Did you notice they weren't water baptized, yet the Spirit of God came on them? Water baptism does not cause salvation. Make sure you understand that. Water baptism is a declaration that you make to Christ. It is a declaration and a remembrance for you to have that when you come out of that water, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. It is like you're declaring from this day forward, I'm going to live for Jesus. That's why water baptism is the first thing you should do when you're born again. You know, 
Water baptism is part of that equation of your walk with Christ. It is a declaration. You have, you're outside Satan's dominion. I'm under the water. I've been born again. I come out of that water, a new creature in Christ Jesus. I'm committing my life to Christ from this day forward. And so it's part of that, uh, part of that whole function, but it does not bring salvation. So I want to make sure I add that. Okay. Now, let's talk about this. The Holy Spirit came on them. Every time we look in the book of Acts, it's the same thing. They receive the baptism. They have the ability to pray in tongues. I know you think that's weird. And it's supposed to be weird. Because we don't want the devil knowing, understanding it. We don't want un- evil people to understand it. It's not about them. It's about the church. And it's God's plan, his system, of bringing into the church his will without evil men or the devil knowing what what is going on. We'll find out here in a minute more about that. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 8. And again, as I go through these scriptures, I I encourage you to write them down because you're going to obviously meet people who are not baptized with the Holy Spirit. Christians that may have been taught that it's not for today. And they need that, especially today. Amen. Need that. Romans chapter 8, verse 22, Paul again here is teaching uh, about the new birth and about, this is a very young church here in Rome. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth. Now, what happens in childbirth, friend? Something that's never existed before in the earth realm is being birthed into the earth realm. Is that right? All right, so hold on to that. Then he goes on, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown, where at? inwardly from our spirit we're going to groan in what are we doing then we are bringing things that we don't know from God's kingdom his thoughts into the earth realm like giving birth to a baby all right verse 26 in the same way what does that mean in like groaning in birthing we are going to birth these things in the same way the spirit of God helps us in our weakness We don't know what we ought to pray for. You know, the Bible doesn't have everything listed in there. It doesn't say your street address. It doesn't tell you what state to live in. It doesn't tell you who to marry. It doesn't give you the details. It gives you the principles. So you can't pray pray the prayer of faith if you don't know God's will. You can't anchor to anything. That's a place of weakness. Well, how do I know, Pastor Gary? I mean, I got decisions to make. How do I know what God's will is? How do I know what to hold on to and fight for? I mean, how do I pray the prayer of faith if I don't know? That's a weak place. Amen, it's a weak place. He said, in the same way, though, this in the same way, groaning from the inside out, the Spirit of God helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we should pray for, but the Spirit of God himself prays for us with groans that words cannot express meaning that I cannot express something I don't know. That's my weakness. My words can't express my weakness. I don't know. I can't express the words. of. I can't express my words of faith and agreement with God. That's a weakness. But God's going to pray for us, intercede for us, that our words can't express. He's going to help us express. Amen. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, the thoughts of God. Isn't that great? No, the thoughts of God, right? Because the Spirit of God intercedes for the saints in accordance with his will. Now, from the inside out, did you catch that? In the same way, from the inside out, you're going to be able to express, bring things into existence that you've never known that are mysteries to you, you, the answers you need for decisions are going to come from the inside out. As God prays through your spirit, his perfect will, his mind, his thoughts, you're going to pick that up and he's going to help you with that. Everyone say, I need that. All right. How does that happen, pastor? I'm glad you asked. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. Paul explains it and let's look at it. All right. In the second chapter here, we find Paul saying that uh, we speak God's secret wisdom, meaning Jesus, the plan of salvation, was hidden from the devil and evil men until his crucifixion. 
It said, none, verse 8, none of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. And we hear that a lot at funerals. But friend, this is written to people that are alive. For today. For living today. Because the next word is what? But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. Revealed what to us? No eye has seen what you've never seen, what you've never heard, and what you've never thought. How many think that would be beneficial? Amen. He says, but God has revealed it to you. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit? Now catch this. Hebrews chapter 4 says the Word of God is active, dividing between soul and spirit. Soul realms your mind. Spirit is the spirit. Now, they're so closely tied together, the Bible says the word of God is able to discern the division between your thoughts and God's thoughts. So he's saying right here that the same thing, who knows the thoughts of a man except your spirit? So your spirit knows your thoughts. They're, real, they're close, so close together you can't even divide, you can't, you can't tell the difference. Who among men know the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Well, that's, that makes sense. We've not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who's from God that we may understand what God has given to us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught us by the spirit expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. Now, Paul talks, uses that same phrase over in chapter 14, which he's talking to the, court, the church there in Corinth about speaking in tongues. He says, well, I'm glad I pray in tongues more than all of you guys, right? He goes on and says, well, what shall I do? He says, I'll pray in the spirit. Or he says, I'll pray with the understanding. Let me just put it in today's language. I'll pray in English and I'll pray in the spirit. I'll pray in tongues. I'll sing in English, and I'll, I'll sing in the Spirit, in tongues. That whole chapter there is talking about praying and speaking in tongues, all right? So here he's using the same words, spiritual words. He's referring to the Spirit of God is praying through us his thoughts. My mind knows my thoughts. His Spirit knows his thoughts. Now, we can receive God's thoughts because his Spirit is now interceding through our spirit as we pray in the Spirit, God's Spirit, we said, intercedes for us. He's praying through us, through our spirit, into the earth realm. The man without the Spirit of God does not accept these things that come from the Spirit, for they are foolish. See, people that don't know God or people that don't, have been taught wrong, they think that's crazy stuff. And that's foolish. That's crazy stuff, right? Because they can't understand it. Verse 15, the spiritual person, the spiritual man makes judgments about all things. He himself is not subject to any man's judgment. See, your judgment only goes so far. It only goes what you've been taught. But you're not held to that, see. Now the Bible says you have access to the thoughts of God. The thoughts of God supersede any judgment of any man, anyone who can discern any decision. See, you have the ability to make decisions every time. Because you're not only limited to the judgment of the earth realm of what men had learned, you're now uncapped, if you will. It's God with you. What you've not seen, what you've not heard, what you've not even thought of, God has that for you by praying in the Spirit. All right? It goes on. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Now, that's crazy to think of that. Who would, know the, who, had, who would know the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? I mean, who knows the mind? And he goes, but we have. We have. Say, I have. I have, I have the thoughts of God. I have. I have the thoughts of God. Say it again. Say it again. I have the thoughts of God. No fear. I have the thoughts of God. It was Jesus' peace. Jesus' peace. Say it. He's my counselor. It's my peace. Though I walk in a troubled world. I will not be afraid, 
for he is with me and I have his thoughts. Even though I've never thought of that idea before or never went there before, he will lead me through the valley of the shadow of death and I shall fear no evil for he is with me. Man, you need to let that sink in big time. Let that sink in big time. But we need to hear. We need to not only hear, we need to be active doing this, praying in the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 14, Paul's teaching this church in Corneth, baby church. In fact, they're so immature in chapter 3, he says, I can't even talk to you as spiritual people. There's, there's a brand new baby church. He says this, when a man or woman speaks in tongue, tongues, no one understands what they're saying. They are speaking what? Mysteries. See it in your Bible? Circle that word mysteries. They are speaking mysteries by the Spirit, capital S. They're, they're speaking, you're speaking mysteries, you're speaking by God's Spirit. See that capital S? By the Spirit of God. You're speaking mysteries. That's things you don't know, friend. Things you need to know. Mysteries. But he who prophesies speak to people for their strength. You see, Paul's talking about the church assembly here when they gather together. He's basically saying, look, you guys are praying in tongues, but you're praying to, you know, no one's going to understand what you're saying. You're praying to God. You're praying mysteries. But it'd be better if you prophesy in church because you'll prophesy in the, that language that they speak. They can receive revelation from that. But he says, the one who speaks in a tongue, verse 4, builds himself up. Some versions say edify themselves. The word edify means bring, to bring instruction. To bring instruction, the one who prophesies builds up the church or brings instruction to the church. Speaking in tongues, you bring instruction to yourself. I don't know about you, but that'd be helpful, wouldn't it? To have instruction from God himself on what to do in a situation, to be able to make right decisions. He says you pray in tongues, God is praying through you his perfect will. We've covered that, Romans 8. Now, your spirit is one with God's spirit. His spirit's coming through your spirit. Remember I said your mind and your spirit are so closely tied together, you can't discern the difference. And up out of your spirit as God's praying through your spirit, bubbles up, because they're so close, bubbles up thoughts, bubbles up thoughts. We call that revelation. I just heard God. I know what to do now. You can interpret to yourself the whole just through your just through your spirit. You could I know I know what to do now. <laughs> if you're not loving this, man, I tell you. Paul said, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in the church. I'd rather speak five words in English, just using our language, than 10,000 words in a tongue. Because they're talking to the church. Notice Paul made the distinction in the church. Paul is correcting the assembly of the church. Now, I want to just bring this point up. Uh, Drenda told me, remind me this. We wrote, read this earlier, how the Spirit of God intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. For God prays his perfect will through our spirit, right? Verse 28, in your Bible, I want to remind you that the Bible was written with no numbers. Okay? The phrase continues. So it says, because the Spirit of God intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who, are, um, who have been called according to his purpose. People pull that verse out and say, well, God does everything. Anything that happens to me, God is doing it for my, bet, for my good. If something bad happens, they say, well, Romans 8, 28 says, you know, God's working all this stuff for my good, even this demonic stuff, even this perverted stuff, even this sickness, even this. No, 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 no. He's saying that in response to this ability to pray in the Spirit. He's going to work that situation out for you. He's going to work good in it. 
He's going to work good in it. Let me say it again. He's going to work good in it because you're tapping into his thoughts. He's going to work it out for you. He's going to turn it for you. You're going to hear his direction, his insight, his wisdom. The Spirit of God is going to do good for you. Okay. Thank you, Drenda. No, I'm serious. Thank you. She brought that to my attention. All right. Paul says, again, I thank God I pray in tongues more than all of you because they are all enamored with the gift. is all new to them, and they're all praying together and, you know, out loud and just a big mess. It's confusion, you know. So he lays out guidelines in the church service how to let the gifts operate. I'm not going to cover that yet. We'll cover it in this series, though. All right, so in the church, do you have that distinction now? Do you understand clearly that being born again is different than the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes? Okay. If I asked you today, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believe, what would your answer be? Have you received? Let's stand to our feet today. Have you believed? Now, first, you've got to be born again. You have to be born again to carry that anointing. And so right now, I want to make sure if you're watching over at Power or online or here, you know, uh, we're not talking about religious things. This is how it works. You need to be born again. That's what the Bible says. How am I born again? The Bible says whoever calls upon the name of Jesus has that legal right to be born again, to come into the family of God, to be filled with his Holy Spirit, to become one with him, to become a child of God, to have access to the promises of God, become a citizen of his great kingdom. Life changes, friend. It's not hard. It's not religious. Whoever calls. Jesus took care of that situation legally. You have to ratify it personally. So bow your heads with me today. And if you're here and you would say, Pastor Gary, you know what? I need the help you're talking about. I don't understand everything you said today yet. But I'll tell you what, it sounded pretty good. I need to figure that out. I need to understand how this works. I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I want to be born again, as the Bible says. I want to face tomorrow with a different perspective. Over at PAL, talking to you online talking to you. And if you're here, we're all going to pray out loud, but if you're here and you say, Pastor Gary, you know, include me in this prayer. If you're a pal or online, I want you to raise your hand right now and say, hey, Pastor, include me in this prayer. I see hands up, hands up, hands up. Include, yes, hands up. Very wise decision. Yeah, hands up. <laughs> I mean, you talk about changing things, man. This is how you do it right here. Yes, sir. This is how you do it. 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 Praise the living God. Amen. All right. Now, all of us, we're going to pray together. And let's just say these words together. Say, Father, you said in your Bible that if I call on the name of Jesus, that you receive me. You make me brand new on the inside. You fill me with your Holy Spirit and teach me how to live life your way. I need that. So today I said yes. I receive your goodness. Jesus on this day, I make you my Savior and my Lord. I receive all your promises as mine. Amen. Amen. Give yourself a hand. All right. Praise God. Now that you're born again, I need to ask you, have you been water baptized? And have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Now, we have water baptism here every month. And that is the first thing you'll see the church does. You're going to make that declaration in the face of the devil, your relatives, everyone else. You're going, to, you're going to be water baptized. It is a declaration of power. For you come out of that water, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. The devil loses his hold on you, and God wants you to recognize that and declare it. That's what water baptism is. If you've not been water baptized, sign up for that. We'd love to, love to agree with you on that. Okay. Number two, if I ask you, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believe, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and you would say, no, i got two things for you to do. Number one, we'd love to pray with you today. You can receive that before you leave today. All right? You can receive it. But it comes by faith. If you're still confused from all the teaching you've heard over the years, and you think, oh, Pastor, it, it, yeah, I see what you said. I need just a little more time to let it sink in where I can say, by faith, I believe that. That's uh, all right. We have a book for you. It's free. Just pick it up on the way out. Over at PAL, they should have it. Online, you can email us. We'll get it to you. But take some time with the Bible in front of you and go through that. 
Maybe you can review today's teaching and just let the Word of God speak for itself. So by faith, when you say, I receive that, there's no doubt there. You're like, man, bring it on. Okay, that's all right. Take some time with that. But we have our prayer team that'll be here in just a minute. Have a seat as we prepare our offering, and they'll be here just after service. If you would like to have us pray with you about that, we would love to do that. All right? Now, let me say this. That same Spirit of God, let's let's just talk. If you have the ability to hear God's thoughts that you've never thought before, how do you think that's going to impact your finances? Oh, there's business ideas you never thought about before. Oh, there's wisdom you have in your present. There's direction there. You see, there are answers there. (laughs) There's answers there, friend. You need this. When we do our conferences, we talk about business, man. We get so many people baptized in the Holy Spirit because they realize, boy, I need that. Yeah, yeah, you need that. So let me encourage you. You need it. You need it. You need it. You need it. But money is important. And God has plans and supernatural strategies to get the money to you. But you need to hear them. You need to hear them. So today as we give, I want you just to get this thought in your mind. You are recognizing that God is your source. We're worshiping him. He's your source. He is going to provide. He's going to show you. So let's stand today as we give and just picture that in your mind. He is my prosperity. All I need is one word from him. All I need is just direction. He is the one that's going to show me where to go. It's going to be awesome. It is awesome. Lay your hand on that giving today. The envelopes go to the back at the, on the way out you know, or on the device. You can see on the screen how to give by device. And if you haven't finished, that's okay. You can do it later today. Just right now, stop and just by faith agree with this. Say these words. Father, Father you said. You said that you give seed to the sower. You give seed to the sower. And bread for eating. And bread for eating. And you'll increase my seed. And you'll increase my seed. That's what I believe. That's what I believe. I give today. I give today. In worship to you. In worship to you. You are my prosperity. You are my prosperity. And I thank you for that. And I thank you for that. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Stay standing. For, we're going to dismiss Drenda. I just want to encourage you to activate the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's one thing to hear it, but faith without works is dead, right? Yeah. So all of us, I want to ask you, how many of you pray in the Holy Spirit now? Raise your hand across the room. Praise God, a lot of you, a lot of you. Would you say next to getting born again, that was the best thing, right? Absolutely. Amen. All right. So you affirm, you're a witness to these others that the Word of God is true, and that's important in your life. And I would encourage you, the Bible says in Ephesians, be ever filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We're not just to pray one time or, you know, one time at the altar. This is a gift of discernment. It's for intercession when you need to pray. Many times while we're doing the altar, I'll be interceding in the Spirit because I know decisions are being made. Yeah. Hearts are hardened and need to be softened. And so you can intercede for your loved ones, for people. You can intercede in the service. It's also a peace to you. Peace, that peace. Whenever turmoil tries to hit you, yeah. you start praying in the Spirit. It's counsel to you, wisdom to you yeah. in your business, yeah. in your family, yeah. in yeah. your finances. Amen. It's protection yes. for you. Yes. Sometimes I've had the Holy Spirit come on me, and I didn't even know what it was for, and I just began to pray in the Spirit and averted a trap or a scheme of the enemy. Yeah. The Holy Spirit counsels and helps yes. you. So this isn't something you just do once in a blue moon, as they say. (laughs) You do this consistently. So I want to encourage you to activate that gift. Also want to encourage those of you that are ready. You're convicted today. I need that. I want that. I want the Holy Spirit. I want the ability to pray in the Spirit and know that all things are working for good because I just interceded over that situation. Now I know the Holy Spirit's on it. The angels are on it. Things are moving. Things are changing. I want that power to be a witness, that power to live the Christian faith. So many people say yes to Jesus, and they don't have the power then to live it out. This is the power. You're missing your armor if you don't have the Holy Spirit. So today, if you'd like to receive that, our prayer team's coming. I want to invite you down. But before we close today, I want to invite those of you who say, I already pray in the Spirit. I want you to activate that gift as a corporate body right now. As Just begin praying. to pray in the Spirit. Our altar team's coming down. If you want the gift, come on down. Come on yeah, down. Come if on you've down. never received and you
you say, I want the gift of the Holy Spirit, come down. They're going to lay hands on you. We're going to believe with you. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to come on you with the evidence of praying in the Spirit, speaking in tongues, and you're going to have the power to live the Christian faith. In this hour, we need that. Amen. Now just begin to pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you for falling in this house, for rebaptizing and refilling your people with the Holy Spirit and with fire, the power to be a witness. Just begin to pray. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this house. You are welcome in this place. Come and fill this atmosphere. Fill your people. Refill us, Lord. Refill us. We need your power. We want a revival in our nation. We want a revival in our churches. We want a revival in the streets. We want to see the power of the Holy Spirit, the power be poured out on all the earth. Your presence and your glory, God, be poured out on all the earth in every church, every place. That's it, that's it. Yeah, yes. Amen, 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 amen. Yeah, we just give you thanks, Father, for that. Yeah, we give you thanks. Amen, amen, amen. That's it, that's it. Yeah, it's yours. You need it. Yeah, you need that. You need it. Yeah, it's yours. Amen. It's yours. It's not hard to receive it. You just receive it by faith. It's in the Word of God. It's right there. Hallelujah. Give you thanks, Father, for that. We just give you thanks, Father. We give you thanks, Father. We give you thanks, Father. We just give you thanks, Father. We give you thanks, Father. Yeah, we just give you thanks, Lord. We give you thanks, Lord. We give you thanks, Lord. Yeah. Amen. 